welcome all of you to our Sabbath School Mission segment. This morning, I have a special guest, Dr. Kimberly Azelton, who is dedicating her life and her career to a type of health ministry and intervention for the salvation of souls that I hope many more physicians will follow. So it's a pleasure to have you this morning, Dr. Kimberly. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you. I've been hearing lots about what you guys have been doing with um, Dr. Kelly as well, and yes, great friends. We, we chat a lot about different ministry opportunities like this. Well, it's interesting how ministry can make new friends. So Dr. Kelly and I didn't know each other a year ago, but now we consider each other friends, and uh, we're, it's a pleasure to have you here this morning. So I'd like to pray before we start. And uh, then we're going to kind of uh, give you a chance to tell us something very exciting that's going on. And my hope is, is that many others will take uh, note of it and dedicate themselves in a similar manner. But let me pray for you as we start and for us that this Sabbath School mission segment does its work. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you how you're moving on the hearts of many people. And your people are rallying as they recognize the signs of the times. And I'm just asking, Lord, today that you'll bless Dr. Azelton as she shares with us, and I don't know how many others whose hearts will be touched to go and do likewise. But certainly, Lord, I do pray that you'll continue to bless and nerve us here, that we might carry on in the path that you've started us in. I pray this morning, even for Dr. Kelly, as he is sharing with a Amen conference in the North Pacific Union, subject matter, perhaps even as we speak. And I'm asking now, Lord, that this time together would bless those in present and those that are watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so uh, Dr. Kimberly, tell us a little bit. Give us the big picture of what's going on, and then we're going to kind of let you direct this conversation. Sure. I am working as a family and lifestyle medicine physician in South Bend, Indiana, but I'm about to launch into something very exciting up in Lansing, Michigan. I had heard. Um, just a couple months, I'll be moving up there and starting a, a primary care physician clinic, but not like one you've really seen before, or at least not very common, because it's both combining meeting physical, spiritual needs of the Lansing community um, in a team-based way. So we'll be working both in tandem with the Lansing Seventh Avenue Church as well as with some people called cross trainers um, to be able to meet all of those different needs in a lot of in really exciting ways. All right, so tell us how this began. I mean, what happened inside of you or did it happen inside of someone else who said, I know someone that could do this? How did this all begin? Sure. Well, you'll see on the screen one of my favorite quotes, uh, medical ministry, uh, page 304, when the cities are worked as God would have them, the result will be the setting and operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. If you read on in the context of that quote, it talks about actually ministers and physicians, canvassers, this team base. Of working together? Working together. Well, that's very interesting you should say that because yesterday afternoon I shared with the Amen uh, conference out in the North Pacific Union, and this was my subject matter. Ellen White actually says that there should be a perfect union between pastors and doctors for this kind of work and Bible workers. Not imperfect, not working separately, exactly. but actually working in tandem, counseling with each other, that they can actually um, be able to pioneer and break open the prejudice in our community and win more souls than anyone would be able to do individually, which is I, I was sitting in, in, I was a student at Weimar at the time when I first started discovering this, and I was like, wow, this will, like, how in the world can this happen? Um, but uh, we started trying it out. We, you know, we were young and, and really excited, and we called up the San Francisco Central pastor and be like, hey, we're reading, you know, ninth volume of the testimonies about the work in San Francisco. What's happened? We're coming down to do it. And... <laughs> Well, when you bring a solution to a problem, you're usually welcomed. It's, when, when you only bring the problem, it's kind of bad news. <laughs> well, we tried to work on a solution, and it was really incredible. Um, there's something called treatment rooms, and we, and we wanted to try to combine canvassing, because we'd done a lot of canvassing with medical missionary work and, and treatment rooms. So we set up a little um, you know, treatment room in the church with some hydrotherapy. We had some nurses doing a lot of health education, health cooking, um, you know, health coaching and cooking, and we were going to 
you know, offer this at, at the doors. And we had been, pilot, you know, kind of experimenting with canvassing and offering these types of things at the doors before. Um, and, and so now, you know, we're trying it out in, in the ghetto of San Francisco. Um, and, you know, a friend and I were knocking on this lady's door and she's like, oh, we get talking with her, you know, and she's like, I just got diagnosed with high blood pressure like yesterday and I have just like so torn up about this. I don't know what to do. It's like, and you guys are right here, like offering, you know, some health coaching for this, like sign me up. And she, she calls the day that she was going to be coming over um, to get her health coaching um, and cooking and whatnot. And she's like, I am so disappointed. I am sick. You know, I've, this is obviously pre-COVID, right? Um, and and she's, she's like, I, I can't make it. And this is and the nurse, you know, who's the one answering the phone is like, oh, well, what symptoms are you experiencing? You know, How, have you heard of something called hydrotherapy? We, you know, we can send someone over to your house right now and, and help you out. And she's like, what? really? <laughs> like, I'm like, you guys don't know me, like, you know, showing the love of Jesus to her. So um, I, I go over to her house, um, give her a Russian steam bath, tuck her in bed, nothing special, you know, I always have prayer, and you know, we read something a little special out of the Bible or whatever, and, um, and she calls the next day, and she's like, um, you know, it's the same nurse that answers the phone, and she's like, I, I don't know who you sent, but I think it was like, it seemed like an angel came to my house. I, I'm all better. It's just like, wow, this is incredible. Uh, she told us actually later that she was the only reason she was comfortable for a stranger to come into her home in San Francisco um, is because we had helped out the elderly neighbor next door. Um, she needed, like, we washed her dishes and, and mopped her floor and, and, you know, came over and sang to her and, you know, gave her a little massage and stuff. Um, and they, you know, they chat, neighbors chat. Um, and, and so she was comfortable letting us into our home, like, okay, these people aren't, aren't too crazy. We're crazy for the gospel. We're not crazy. Um, we're, we're crazy for good reasons. Um, and turns out she had actually fallen away from going to church. Um, I didn't bring up anything particularly like doctrinal or religious in particular, but she instantly like talking to that nurse again, she was like just in gratitude and her mind started going back to how can I go back to God? It was just like a God-given connection um, between the medical work and the gospel work. We're talking about how the synergy of these two working together and there's just a God-given connection um, that this lady started going back to church. She started getting Bible studies. Um, and I wanna see that happen in, in Lansing, Michigan. Well, I want to see it happen a whole lot more places, too. I think so. I mean, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, I'm going to be preaching for their church service at 145 today, so when I finish here and this place clears out, and I'm going to use that illustration in my sermon, <laughs> because the real bottom line is, to get to where the right arm of the gospel is received, there'll have to be plenty of other ministries that yes. cross that bridge chasm, yes. that, that trust chasm and build a bridge. And what happened there was that there was a little sense that you people might be okay mm -hmm. because you came and did some pretty ordinary things in the name of love. And beyond that, God does send his spirit with you. Mm -hmm. So the truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit's connecting dots that you didn't even have to connect, but you were needed to connect them. I have a tool in God's hand. And guess what? I, didn't, I wasn't a doctor at that point. I didn't have to know any crazy amount of knowledge and go to school for any amount of years. I just had to have some love and compassion for, for somebody and just simply go and be there and do, and do what was needed. Love and compassion. That's the transformative love of God flowing through you to prepare you to live amongst the angels. Mm -hmm. Now, as you're talking, I'm thinking about something. I just finished preaching a sermon where I referenced to education page 271, an army yes. of youth rightly trained. That training for you was probably more valuable to you than anything you ever read in a book. Yes. You were actually transformed in the process. You have an illustration of how it works. God gave you the satisfaction of being his hands, his voice, his love to a person who was actually literally blessed by heaven through the principles of health and the presence of someone who loves Jesus. If I could read a quote um, in my, one of my favorite little worn out books called uh, Call to Medical Evangelism. Um, and this, what you're, what you're talking about, this, this army that's meeting people's needs in love and compassion and winning souls, would like to see that happen as, as cross trainers up with the Lansing um, Church as well as the Lansing Clinic. Um, it, it says, um, 
There should be companies organized and educated most thoroughly to work as nurses, evangelists, ministers, canvassers, gospel students, to perfect a character after the divine similitude. You'd think, oh, you know, we need this company evangelism to go and like win the city of Lansing. Uh, we actually need it for what you brought up is to perfect a character after divine similitude. We need this for, for ourselves to prepare us for wider service for God as well as win souls in the process. But that's the Holy Spirit's work. Yeah, but you know, you're a student at Weimar, so you were either in an academy or college there during those period of time. What was it? Were you a college student? College. Okay, so here you are, a young woman at that period of time, and you are out being used by God, the transforming power to shape a trajectory on your whole career. Because as a doctor, you could go out and there would be nothing wrong with you making lots of money. Making it only for yourself would be problematic to your own soul's salvation as well as to the loss that would come upon many other people. The actual making of the revenue is not a problem, but it's the purposeless living. Mm -hmm. And the transformation of heart, mind, and purpose in an encounter like this not only opens up people to want to read our books and trust us into their homes, it, it has the power to completely turbocharge this... this uh, it's like the, the fire in the stubble. But there's so much skepticism out there because there's so little real love and so little real trustworthiness that, that the society we're in is imploding. Our churches are dying. But what you're talking about, we don't have enough people in our schools to do the work you're talking about. We would only be scratching the surface if every single person was in some big city or medium-sized city all across this nation. So that's why we're having actually, um, when, when this, these types of company evangelists come up to Lansing, we're actually looking for seven of them, um, we're having a field training school right alongside of it. So there'll be interns for that eight months um, working between the church and the clinic. You can see up on the, on the screen kind of a little sch schematic of the center and the heart of what we want to do is soul winning. Um, and so the cross trainers, these, these company evangelists um, that are working as canvassers, as evangelists, as gospel students, um, as medical missionaries in the Lansing, working and being trained at the si same time between the church and the clinic up in Lansing. Yeah, that's powerful. Now, in preparing for the message I shared yesterday with the Amen Conference in the North Pacific Union, I came across a quote. And in that quote, Ellen White says, it's not just doctors and nurses and pastors, it's everybody. The end goal of their life and their profession is to soul win. Mm -hmm. To think that somebody could miss out on knowing Jesus and living with him through all eternity ought to nerve people. And the devil knows this, so he's trying to somehow lower our sights into just enjoying what we can enjoy right here, right now. So tell us where you're at in the process. Yeah, so I'm finishing up fellowship down in um, South Bend, Indiana, Memorial Hospital. So I'm working um, with my patients there, um, as, as well as finishing up a fellowship in health uh, care administration. Um, then we'll be starting the clinic um, this fall um, in tandem with the Lansing Seventh-day Adventist Church. The, ca the cross trainers will be landing August 22. Um, and so they'll have their orientation and start with their nutrition module in the field training school and they'll get trained in health coaching and on culinary medicine and culinary study gets neighborhood cooking parties a whole ton of really awesome but very simple um soul winning tools so then by the time the clinic starts they'll be ready to roll right in um, and be trained and mentored to another level on the clinic side then as, as soon as they're teaching as soon as they're learning something the best way to learn it is turn around and teach someone else exactly. so then turning around and training and empowering church members because we can't just it can't just be the army of youth and it can't just be the physicians and pastors every church member, each one of us reaching out every single day in love and care to all of those around us, no matter what felt needs we have. So we want to put tools into the hands of everyone to be able to soul win. Okay, so um, day by day, each of us, God architects our day with some intentionality. We, we have some of these engagements. Certainly things are, are constructed like programs, like what you're getting ready to do here. So starting in August, you're looking for seven, is that what you said, for this first round? Mm -hmm. And I can see there's a slide up here on, on how people can get in contact with you. Tell us a little bit about those seven. So all day long, they'll be engaged in some kind of preparation or, or actually linking with the community. Mm -hmm. um, when, when they come, they're gonna be there for how long again, did you say? 
How long is their training? This is an eight-month commitment. Eight so month basically commitment. a student missionary right in um, the United States, right in kind of the Capernaum of Michigan, in, in Lansing, Michigan, yeah. uh, to be able to reach one of our largest cities. In every, in every city, we should have a medical missionary um, center. We should have a clinic um, in association with the, with the church. Um, and so they have that opportunity to be able to be there for eight months to be a company evangelist, dedicate um, that time to not only um, work um, in, in company evangelism and between the church and the clinic, but also get trained for wider service um, for, for the future. I mean, we have some of the best people coming through to be able to train in each of these different areas and then immediately be able to put it into practice, and then immediately turn around and, and train others. Um, so we, we have, you know, a pre-med student coming through because, hey, I would have, I'm really excited that he's coming. I would have loved to have that opportunity to, before medical school, mm -hmm. be able to work in a way, in a system that combines health and, um, you know, spiritual care for people. And, you know, the church and the, and the clinic and all these things um, and work, um, you know, with more lifestyle medicine and dealing with the root cause of disease rather than saying, here, take this pill, have a nice day. Yeah. So, you know, it, it appears to me that God is trying to reinvigorate this health message. He's trying, as it were, to put the right arm back on the body so that it can work and it can do the job it's supposed to do. Tell me a little bit about how you're linking with the Lansing Church or churches. Sure, yeah. So specifically, I'll, I'll come at it at two different angles, one from the clinic and one from the, from the cross trainers. So the cross trainers um, will be working um, two days a week with the Lansing, uh, with the Michigan Conference of Literature Ministries, um, canvassing. Um, and so they'll, that's, that's, you know, how they'll support themselves. And you know, if you have a bad day of canvassing, that's okay. We, you know, it's kind of a set, um, how you'll get your stipend and such. Um, and so, but you'll also be getting co really connected with a community during that time with canvassing, um, being able to offer a ton of services. Usually we go door to door offering surveys of like, hey, what's, what's the community needs and things like that. No, hey, you have a health need. We can meet that right away. You need to go to the clinic. Sure, you can do that. You need, you know, you don't know how to cook healthy. You want to do that. All right, I'm right there. Um, you know, I just, you, whatever needs you might have, that we can help you. That changes the whole calculus of being at somebody's door. All of a sudden now, it's not just to put a piece of literature in their hands. It's about something very viable in this escalating age of lifestyle-induced disease. It's like you've got something going on, and it's practical, and it takes a little bit of work, but it's not expensive. And to have that going on at the church is a real game changer to what the conversations at the door can be like. The, the pilots that we've done have, have been pretty incredible, and I'm really excited. So the other um, days of the week, they'll be actually following up on those contacts um, that they've gleaned, either from canvassing or from events that the church is doing or from referrals that I'll be making from the clinic as well. Plenty of my patients will, will want um, to, to take advantage of that. I mean, I don't know. How, at least every day I'm in clinic, there's at least two, three people that, you know, I'm sitting down, we're talking about their diabetes, talking about their high blood pressure, talking about, you know, their obesity or whatever they, whatever lifestyle induced disease that they have. And they're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to cook differently than like, how do I do this? Like what, what, you know, how can I, I haven't, I don't know where to kind of turn and like, how, how do I cook this way? Like where, like problem solving on like where to exercise and like how much and, and you know, just how the health literacy. They need um, coached. They need a coach to encourage them and motivate them. Um, but they Occasionally also. Occasionally challenge them. Yeah, to challenge them, to, to help them in every aspect because I'm literally sitting there like drawing a grocery store like okay you know this is where new places new things in that grocery store that yeah. you've never seen before that Hang you need to here. check out <laughs> <laughs> not in those middle aisles yeah. you know right. um, and it's just to be able to have a cross trainer go in and do a grocery store for a tour for somebody and then go and take those groceries and cook with them in the home and do some culinary medicine you'll um, form a bond won't you yeah you form a friendship and it's 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 all connected in with the clinic, and, um, and I, I think it'll be really exciting. It already is, and I want to encourage you as you get ready to tie off what you're doing in South Bend. We need you to, have, we need you to come back every once in a while and give us some little updates. 
This morning, though, you're here. You are, uh, the, the program is open for people to get a hold of you and talk to you. What kind of final appeal or summary of our time together would you like to make? Sure. Yeah, an eight months um, t- opportunity for young people or young at heart to be able to serve for eight months in reviving city work um, in the city of, in the in the state of Michigan, right where medical missionary work began. And in this time in Earth's history, what more could we be doing um, than working for the Lord in the most impactful and powerful way that God is calling us um, to do? So I really encourage you to pray. Um, Let um, people that you know that might be interested in serving for eight months um, as cross trainers, cross trained across all these different areas of health, canvassing and Bible studies and, and, and all these different areas to work with the church and the clinic. Let them know. Be praying yourself if God is calling you to be able to join something like this. Um, if I may read um, ninth volume of the Testimonies, page 171, it says, Workers, gospel medical missionaries are needed now. You cannot afford to spend years in preparation. Soon doors now open to the truth will be forever closed. Carry the message now. Do not wait, allowing the enemy to take possession of the fields now open before you. Let little companies go forth to do the work to which Christ appointed his disciples. Let them labor as evangelists, scattering up publications, talking of the truth to those they meet. Let them pray for the sick, ministering to their necessities, not with drugs, but with nature's remedies, and teaching them how to regain health and avoid disease. It's time we revive this work, and it's time we revive it now before the enemy lays any more um, obstacles in our way. And God will help us fulfill these promises. If we do God's work according to how he's ordained it, you know, it just might work. And I really want to be a part of it, and I think you guys should too. Well, I, I want to watch it work because I think you're right. It just might work. I think we ought to try it, don't you? I think so. I think so. And we want to pray that God will bless you in it. We know we had an immersion program here, probably the single largest undertaking stateside of anything we've ever done. This beautiful spirit that came out of it, the results were phenomenal. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's wanting to expand the army that uh, makes this work work because it's the final work in the midst of a skeptical world that will work. So, well, let me have a prayer for you, Dr. Azelton, that the Lord will bless you and that anybody here or watching online will make the contacts with you. Uh, God certainly is, uh, Ellen White says in the book, uh, Acts and the Apostles, that people are going to answer this call. And let's be praying for the right ones for this time because uh, this is an uh, introductory journey into this, hopefully only the first round of doing it, but uh, an important round where things will be learned and ad- adaptations will be made and certainly blessings will be given. So let me pray for you. Lord, uh, thank you for how you're moving on people's hearts. And I pray, Lord, may we respond, may we not be afraid. May we walk with you and wait in anticipation to see what you're going to do next. May we be faithful and may we sacrifice. But in the end, Lord, may we realize that you build the house and that you give us a part in doing it. And thank you for that. Please touch people's hearts, Lord. Uh, There may be some here today for whom you're calling to participate in something like this, to where they could be a part of the retraining of our churches for the right arm of the gospel, which is this health ministry work. Now, bless us to that end. Give Dr. Azelton strength, wisdom, grace, rest, and all the things that she will need as she partners with the Lansing community. And now, Lord, may more of this kind of work take place in more places, we pray. May we be available and may we be committed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. And it's a pleasure to get to know you and to hear about what God is doing. It's now time to study our Sabbath school lessons. So we will invite all of you to get your lessons out. And we do want to encourage participation from the floor. I invite the panel to come join me here. And we are going to look at this continued story of the covenants, the life of Abraham, the remnant, and the church. All right, welcome panel. Nice to have you here this morning and welcome uh, fellow students sitting on the floor of this church. And we hope that you'll all relate to this as a group Bible study. As I've mentioned before, I've relocated my place at the panel to be able to see you better. So we want to encourage you to uh, raise your hand 
And uh, we do have a microphone for this morning. And as we delve into the idea of God's promises, we're going to be blessed. So let's ask God to bless our lesson study. And I think I'll ask Carletta, if you would, to have prayer for our lesson study. And then we'll do a brief introduction of who's at the panel today and go forward. Dear Father, thank you for bringing us all together here to study together and help us to be blessed as we study your word and as we understand more how, how our special role as your people influences our lives and those of others. Be with us, bring us wisdom, bring us the insights you want us to have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's start over here with Bob Hess. If you just introduce yourself briefly as we go around the table here, then we'll jump into the lesson. I'm Bob Hess. I'm one of the uh, retired pastors, an elder here, and uh, I teach a lesson once in a while. Um, We're glad you're here this morning. Let's go to the, our teacher next to you. Hi, I'm Brittany Birmingham. I teach eighth grade at Village Adventist Elementary School, and it's Mother's Day weekend, so I'm going to talk about my little girl. She's downstairs, and we have been blessed. I'm also due in October with a little boy, so we're, Congratulations. <laughs> we've got a lot of exciting things coming. Yeah, you do. Big news. The school from which you never graduate. <laughs> All right. Carletta? Carlotta Witzel, I'm retired from having done many different jobs, and now I have time to work for the church. And you've been working for the church all your life. We're glad you're still working in your retirement. David? I'm David Mann. I serve as an elder here at the church, and I also help out with the USAVA school generally. Very good. David has also served our church in a variety of ways. Pastor Dennis, I'm an assistant pastor here at Village, and uh, it's just a blessing to be here again today. Amen. All right, our memory text says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Our lesson starts with uh, a point of reference that was not such a good point of reference. Old story from C.L. Paddock's book, God Minutes. This was the book that won me to Christ. My first devotional studies as a seventh grader at Peoria Junior Academy were out of this book. And so uh, I can see the clock almost in my mind because there's a picture in the first version of this book. People stopping, thinking they had more time to get to work than they had because the point of reference was no longer quite as trustworthy as it had been. As we think about God keeping his commitments Everyone, depending on that clock that stopped at quarter to nine, weren't quite as faithful in keeping theirs, although it was really to no neglect of their own. But God is depending on us to be in partnership with him for the world so they can know what time it is. And so they can have these beautiful invitations, whether it's to a physical need that links into a spiritual need, as Dr. Azelton was just sharing. But God's banking on the relationship we have with him to do something special for the world. So imagine how hard the world's trying that is Satan, to distract us and take away our passion for helping the world know it's about time to see Jesus. Okay, the week at a glance at the bottom of the page says, what covenant promises did the Lord make to Israel? What conditions came with them? How did the uh, nation abide by these promises and what happened when they disobeyed? That kind of are the questions of this week's lesson. So let's jump into Sunday made to above all people. Deuteronomy 7, 6, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And I highlighted in my lesson the word chosen. And if you're here this morning, you're chosen. And it's a special choosing. So I think kind of what we have to understand is, you know, how does it work? Why does it work? And what do the privileges uh, revolve around this. Uh, the first paragraph, the last half of it says, the crucial point to remember too is that this choice was totally the act of God, an expression of his grace. There was nothing found in the people themselves that made them deserve this grace. Pastor Page, would you mind looking up Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8? And this helps explain the Lord's choosing. So, some of you may have checked in on that verse already. Pastor Bob, I see you're ready to make an observation. Yeah, uh, my father had an uncle who was a spirit medium. A spirit medium. And the, the devil claims the children and the relatives 
of his mediums. And uh, the devil came to my father uh, in the night more than once, once as his mother who had died. So <clears throat> the devil harassed him because he was a nephew of a spirit medium. Well, Abraham's children are called because the promise was first given to Abraham. And God claims the children of his people. What a beautiful thought. <clears throat> Amen. So he claims us. Very good. Pastor Page, you mind reading that for us? Sure. It says, uh, this is Ezekiel 16, 8. It says, Now, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, and I covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. All right, so God chose us at a vulnerable moment. In this case, he provides immediate respect, dignity, covering, and protection for us. All right, I'm looking at that next paragraph down. It's a pretty powerful paragraph. It comes from a man named J.A. Thompson. Uh, and I want to pick up um, the ultimate cause, about four lines down under the question. The ultimate cause for that choice lay in the mystery of divine love. Yet the fact is that God did love Israel and did choose her, thereby honoring his promise to the fathers. She had been chosen in virtue of Yahweh's love for her. She had been liberated from slavery in Egypt by a display of Yahweh's power. Let her once grasp these great facts, and she would realize that she was indeed a holy and special treasure to people. Mm -hmm. Any tendency on her part, therefore, to surrender such noble status was reprehensible in character. And if you go to the next paragraph, it talks about being a royal and a priestly race. Wow, pretty special. Um, when I was reading the Ezekiel 8, I think you have to go, to really understand the chosen, you have to go back to verse 4, looking at 4 through 6. I mean, this is, this is when it says, as for your nativity on the day you were born, all these things didn't happen to the child. The navel cord wasn't cut. You weren't washed with water. You weren't rubbed down with salt. You were left in a field. This is an abandoned child. Like, the love of God, I, I appreciate eight, you know, when I pass by again, but this is the second time he's passed by. The first time, it was somebody that nobody wanted, and I think that is so relatable for ourselves. Sometimes we're like, God, you know, here I am again, and I've messed up, and I'm this, and I'm that, and he says, I, I know. <laughs> you were unwanted. Sometimes the whole world won't want you, but I do, and there's no, at the end of this, there's no reason for why he chose him. It says, when I passed by you, I saw you struggling in your own blood, which, I don't know, parents out there, this is, this is pretty tragic, this child that's dying. And it says, I said to you, live. Amen. <laughs> why? We don't know. <laughs> that's the divine mystery. We don't know why he walked by this child and said, live. And it's like, wow, that's, that's me. There's nothing that kid was doing. There's nothing that... You know, there's no reason for it except divine, mysterious love. Yeah, because uh, if we were to take the metaphor of parenting, which this metaphor is, we would realize that when you put your mantle of protection over somebody, the whole future is full of a lot of heartache and commitment. And God sees beyond all of that because love transcends all of that and says, I see the beauty, the future, the potential, the joy. Okay, comment in the back. Yes, I would like to point out that God's righteousness, His merit, is what leads Him to choose to make us penitent so He may pardon us. Our great need is our only merit. And that's what this scripture is pointing out. God sees our great need, and because of His righteousness, he chooses to set his love on us. And that is what grace is all about. Love for the undeserving. Yeah, that's what love's all about, since God is love, right? So that's what motivates us. It's the love of Christ that compels us, according to Paul, writing to the book of Corinthians. And may it continue to do so. Any other thoughts from the floor? I see Pastor Page has one here. 
Okay, I'll let uh, John Dronin watch over the congregation on the floor. Go all ahead. Right. Um, I highlighted all those same verses, and what came to my mind is, you know, God's no respecter of person. And when you mentioned the word chosen, it reminded me here in Ephesians, it says that uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know, before sin ever, sin ever entered, God had already chosen us. As he was thinking about his creation, he had chosen us that we would be found in Christ, that we would be ordained to be a special people. Everybody, not just some people, but everybody was chosen. Yeah, and that's so a beautiful thing to it think It is about. a beautiful thing that God would choose the redemption of man in total. The total price was paid. And yet, in the midst of that group, all of them at some level ready to be, could easily have been rejected by the universe did it not mirror the love of God. He comes and he picks a special people to work with him to reach people. Now against the backdrop of being royal and being priestly, which is what God called us to. And by the way, Peter picks up on this when he says the same things in the New Testament. These, these elements of obligation. I mean, it's been a little bit of a scandal, has it not, that some people wanted out of the royal family as of recent? And there are people today who I think don't understand the great privilege. Part of it is the kind of responsibility you carry. But if you lose sight of the great privilege of being related to the king and the great glory of knowing him personally and having these privileges, then it all gets twisted around. So we're above all people of the earth, considering that God's called us as a function of this Abrahamic promise, seed, as it were, children. We get, the, we get to carry the privilege forward. So when we don't teach our kids that we're living in the privilege, and the privilege is knowing God, and when somehow we only have a form of godliness which doesn't have a lot of draw, we almost can inoculate our kids to the privilege. So it's kind of like a good marriage. It's either all or nothing. You either have a rich, rewarding experience because you're going to go all the way to the end to keep it alive and fragrant and beautiful, or you're going to end up slowly drifting into distance. It's one or the other. And you only think you sort of have an okay marriage for a little while because it's, it's headed a direction. And eventually it gets there, whether it was pointed in the right direction or the wrong. And nothing's any different with God. Bob? Uh, in this time when privilege is a curse supposedly. We are God's privileged children, and we shouldn't look down on that. That is a special privilege, and we should take advantage of it, not for personal gain, but to reach others, to bring them into the privilege as well. Well, privilege exercised for one's own benefit is a curse, but privilege exercised for the benefit of all, because in this world, Jesus told us you're going to have the poor always. And Ellen White will tell us that every advantage we have makes us indebted to the rest of the world. So without exercising that privilege for the liberation of individuals, we will be cursed. The curse will come back upon us. But when we exercise that privilege for the sake of those who have not yet entered into the blessings, in this case, of the spiritual relating to God, uh, when we exercise it the right way, we spread the privilege around. We'll go here and then here. Um, when the clock story... You couldn't help but hear the echo of John Winthrop, anyone else? <laughs> and the city on a hill. And this idea that, you know, in 1630, only 10 years after um, the pilgrims have arrived, he is war it's a warning. It's been interpreted and misinterpreted all throughout history and used to, um, you know, make people who, who they want it to be. But it says, as a city on a hill, you are, in his, in his sermon, he says, we are as a city on a hill, the eyes of the people are upon us. And it was a warning. It wasn't a, we're above all people, we are this city on a hill, everyone's looking to us because we're amazing. His is a dire warning that if we do not, he says, if we deal falsely with God, so to cause him to withdraw his present help, we shall be a story and a byword throughout the world. There is a warning with this privilege. It is a privilege. It's a great and mighty privilege. But what we do with it makes all the difference in the world. It does. And of course, that's the storyline of Israel as we study our whole week's lesson out. The question is, is it the storyline of our own life, our own family generations, our own church? 
And uh, when we get to the, the blessings and the curses, it's a, a pretty amazing rounding off of this very thing you're saying. You know, when you look at Israel and uh, compare it to us as a church, as a body of believers today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, we're called to be above all people in the, in the way that, you know, we're given a privilege of taking the, the love and character of God to the world. All the blessings, as you said, bestowed upon us makes us responsible for bestowing it upon others. Uh, we're to live out the grace that he has given so that his law could be seen, lived out in our lives, and others can come to know him. You know, I was thinking about this, and I remembered a quote from Acts of the Apostles, and this comes from page 14. Speaking of God's people, it says, but the people of Israel lost sight of their high privileges as God's representatives. They forgot God and failed to fulfill their holy mission. The blessings they received brought no blessing to the world. All their advantages they appropriated for their own glorifications. Glorification. They shut themselves away from the world in order to escape temptation. The restrictions that God had placed upon them for their association with idolaters as a means of preventing them from conforming to the practices of the heathen they used to build up a wall of separation between themselves and other nations. Now this last part here, I don't want you to miss. It says, she says, they robbed God of the service he required of them and they robbed their fellow men of religious guidance and a holy example. You think about this, are we today robbing God of the service he has required of us by neglecting to take the good news and the gospel message to our neighbors and to the world. Okay, I think unfortunately we might find ourselves indicted by some of the things in that paragraph. Um, I know in the Adventist church and in some areas it's stronger than, in some areas it's stronger than others, there's a loss of the sense of the remnant. And I had a family member a couple of years ago say, where do we get off thinking that we're the remnant? When we lose that, we lose the sense of responsibility and the value that God has placed on us to be his ambassadors. So if we don't know who we are, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we should be doing. And I think the lesson kind of handled that. Where do we get off thinking we're the remnant? Well, God said you are. Right. And responsibility comes with it. So that's what the next day's lesson is about, actually. Let's go to Monday. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, 28, that is, we have the blessings and the curses. So let's open our Bibles there. It's very interesting that in this covenant, God lines out what he wants to do, and then he lines out what will happen if somehow... Our relationship is allowed to spiral into the hands of the world. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, perhaps David, you could read verse 1 and then read verse 15. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. All right, and verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Okay, is that fair? Is it healthy? Is it normal? Is it good? Oh, there's a lot of questions there. And have you noticed that the curses are about twice as many as the blessings? So is obedience self-righteousness and righteousness by works, or is obedience uh, part of a love relationship when God is God? Now, I got married in a church like this almost 36 years ago. I made some promises. I don't think my wife ever thought that me keeping any of those promises for a moment was legalism. And I don't think she thought it was bad for me or her. And I said I'd do it. And somehow we're living in this weird spiritual environment where the devil has actually been able to take through soundbite interactions with the church and God and his word and make obedience look like it's legalism. 
Now, let's just remember, folks, legalism is a disease of the intents. It is not a disease of the actions. It's a disease of motivations, not a disease of action. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, and some things that look wrong might actually turn out to have a little less illegitimacy than they appear to have. All right, we'll jump to the floor. I think, I think it's similar to what um, was kind of overlooked last week. When those kings came against the kings of Sodom, as we talked about last week briefly, those kings that came against Sodom were actually descendants of Shem. And the descendants of Sodom were descendants of Canaan, who had been cursed by Noah because of the immodest approach of Ham and subsequently Canaan in regards to the relationship there. And Noah cursed Canaan, saying that he would be the servant of Shem and Japheth. So when they came and took the people of Sodom as servants, they thought they were carrying out the curse of God. But the problem was they themselves were idolaters. And when God moved upon Abraham to rescue his nephew Lot, he also rescued the people of Sodom in the process. And one of the kings was killed because he was an idolater. He was not protected by God. So we see how the curses that were given to a specific um, person in the Bible here is actually something that is also applied to the descendants of Shem and Javeth when they depart from God. And they were also, as we look in the lesson later on here, there's an element of a, a, a blessing to Noah, which they could have been in. So any curse that's foretold by God is actually a warning that it could be different because it's not in God's heart to do this. So we find ourselves recognizing here that warnings are often gospel messages, but that's not where we're living, folks, which is why we need to press together and have biblical definitions. I apologize if I'm always giving a history lesson up here, but it is what I do. So uh, this brings me back to kind of a modern era of this. When we look at the Israelites in the Bible times, sometimes it's hard for us to connect with them. Um, but sticking with John Winthrop and the Puritans, the Puritans have an incredible opportunity by God um, to, to create a, a city on a hill. And just to give you a little background, John Winthrop lands in Salem, Massachusetts, and you know the legacy of Salem. And I think it's fascinating that when you have this, this warning, Ellen White tells us in The Great Controversy that many of the Puritans, when they came here, came here with this God-fearing focus, and yet when it became selfish, when it became their own, when it became their own righteousness and their own deciding how to deal with other people's religion, it disintegrated. It, it became destructive. It killed innocent people. She says uh, in chapter 16, Pilgrim Fathers, if you haven't read it, it's, it's very powerful to even our, our witness today. She says, yet honest and God-fearing as they were, some of the Puritans did not comprehend the great principle of religious freedom, the freedom for which they had sacrificed so much themselves. They were not equally ready to grant to others. The Catholic belief that God gave the church the right to control thinking and to find and punish sin is one of the most deeply rooted of Catholic errors on Christian hearts. And when they took it upon themselves to judge the world, when they took it upon themselves to, to be God, it hurt their community instead of going out and being God in the loving sense, in the compassionate sense, and what they could have done you know, as a giant community. Now, we know there's a remnant. God doesn't leave his people without somebody. Roger Williams and many of them end up creating oasises. But as a whole, the majority of the, the people that came were very prejudiced. And I, I can see that in today's world sometimes, where Christians get so wrapped up in, the, in their bubble, um, like the walls of Israel and the, and the kind of the separation of many of the Puritans that they forget that we are a city on a hill among the people of the world, that we are to be bringing God's love and God's compassion in this beautiful way that draws them into the walls of the city, draws them into the protection of the Lord, doesn't keep them out. Exactly. And uh, the embodiment of that love should tincture everything we do. Now, we know that um, there was a prophet by the name of Jonah 
who went into a city that was very corrupt. God worked in spite of him. God worked through him. It was a gospel warning still. He ran away from their redemption. And God said, oh, no, you're not. Uh, and God's not giving up easy on the remnant. We have responsibilities. In the midst of those responsibilities, transformation is for us. Okay, I see from the floor. I love to sympathize with people like the ancient Israelites. When one looks at the origins of your own life, when you are raised in poverty, in alcoholism, in warfare in the home, and for whatever reason, God draws one member of that family out and places them in a situation where you begin to identify a totality of difference in life. It becomes, it becomes a heart sore to look around you and see a dying community. You come to church and you see the possibilities of God and his covenant applying to all of these people, and you are a part of it by God's grace. Yeah, praise the Lord. As you're talking, many here can probably identify with that. At some level, I certainly can, listening to you talk. So God plucks somebody out, and he doesn't pluck them out to say, forget about all those people. He plucks them out to say, see them like I see them. Love them like I love them. All right? Okay, let's come back to the lesson then. Okay, right here, David. Um, one thing that uh, Brittany pointed out is uh, that one crucial aspect of the remnant is the doctrine does matter. Um, that when we, I had a friend a few years ago who said to me, you know, when I study the Bible, I don't study doctrine. And I thought, well, what, what exactly does that mean? Doctrine does matter because it impacts our behavior, it impacts our beliefs as the remnant. Um, for example, if we believe that hell burns forever, that impacts our view of God. If we, imp if we believe that God can change the Sabbath, then anything in Scripture can be changed. So doctrine does matter. It's important for us as a remnant to have a very clear view of what this book teaches. Yeah, so, and her illustration was really good. If you don't have a doctrine about freedom of conscience and being made in God's image to think for yourself, then you're ready to be run over ruin your life, and maybe run other people over in the process of it. So doctrine is just systemized truth. It's just one, one element of understanding put together in a whole, a larger corpus or body, and now we have a well-rounded understanding on a subject matter. And I'm thinking about this whole idea of legalism. When I was a child, I'm kind of still like this as an adult, I gave my heart very easily, and I adored my parents. So if my parents gave a rule, I did my best to obey it. And if I didn't follow, it was enough punishment for me to see their disappointment. That's just the kind of child I was. But I would love to see us all as Christians have that kind of relationship with God, that we obey, we do what God asks of us because we adore him. And it's enough punishment to know that we've disappointed him and to want to come back and make it right. Yeah, and, and ideally, the innocency of a child's heart is protected for the pain of that disappointment. Unfortunately, hearts can get little self-focused and locked to where much stronger measures are brought to awaken them. I think of the boy in the pig pen. You know, he had to be broken to the most elemental level of being hungry for food to say, hmm, I don't think my dad was the problem after all, was he? All right. You know, the beautiful thing about the thought process, like I think about like this about God a lot often, you know, how many times do we disregard the fact that God has feelings and that he relates to us as a parent or in the context of a marriage uh, relationship as it's depicted in the Bible as well. But the beautiful thing is when we know we come short, as it says in Isaiah 119, he says, if you're willing, and obedient. I love the fact that he put willingness first because we do all come realize, at least I, I hope we all do come to the realization that to, to harmonize with God is something that's impossible for us to accomplish ourselves. But if we're willing, 
He says, then I can work in you to accomplish my good pleasure. Amen? That's a beautiful thought to know that if we just give ourselves to him and say, you know what, I'm willing, Lord, this is where I struggle, but I'm willing to submit to your word because I trust you, love me, and care for me. The power of God works in our lives in amazing ways. Yeah, so being willing is a big deal because our appetites and our interests may be totally calibrated to go the other way. And that period of turning them around is a period of continual surrender and willingness. The discovery of a new love is hard to do until the old love dies. And of course, dealing with marriages, when there's an alien bond or a third person that gets into the picture, it destroys what was there originally. So the devil's trying to destroy any potential for loving God by making sure there's a love affair going along with self that's rooted in the world. So let's, let's let ourselves be in the hands of God to be made will, willing so that those feelings can actually fully develop. Uh, I had two boys that were very different in nature. Um, the younger one was compliant and wanted to please. The older one had a little more of a rebellious spirit. And it took different measures for him than it did for the younger one. And uh, God puts in his, in his word both the cursings and the blessings. And if we understand who God is, we are happy to, to submit to him and thankful for the blessings. But I pray for my children and grandchildren that God will do whatever needs to be done in their life to get their attention. And Israel went through some rough times to get their attention. And sometimes it didn't work and sometimes it did. And eventually it had to be a very hard lesson, uh, captivity to Babylon and so on. So God gives us the privilege of easy response but he loves us enough to give us the other if we will respond to it. Yeah, and so if we come back to the whole component of willing and two different boys, we're back at the prodigal father, prodigal son, whatever. Um, clearly, neither of them really were willing in the beginning. And one was taught by the loss of wealth and maybe health that he didn't see his dad the right way. And if we give God permission to save them from eternal loss, it may mean the loss of things on earth, but it's not the loss of the privilege of really getting to know oneself and know the people in your life, in this case, including your own parents or your father. Um, I, if you continue in chapter 16 about the, the founders of our nation, you get to Roger Williams. And to me, that's just the ministry that you were talking about earlier. I don't remember her name, but um, Dr. in Azel. the mission spotlight. Mm -hmm. That to me was like, wow, we aren't just a church. We're not just four walls. We're not just show up on Sabbath. And if you don't know Adventism, you know, figure it out some way. You know, we are going out there outside of Sabbath and outside of um, necessarily even spiritual, connecting the spiritual, but we're going to meet a need that people need um, that isn't necessarily spiritual, but then the spiritual comes with it. And to me, that's the part that, Israel, and you see this in the Puritans, and you see this, that, that, that was missing, the, that evangelism that went out and showed it. And what we see it with Roger Williams, and Ellen White says, can you imagine this as a church? Just picture instead of a colony, picture this as our church, all right? Listen to this. His little state, or his little church, Rhode Island, of course, became the asylum for the oppressed, and it increased and it prospered, just like Abraham's seed was promised, right? And the found, until its foundation principles became the cornerstones of the great American Republic. Europeans flocked to America that they might enjoy her fruits, escaping wars, escaping famines, oppression and persecution, for America's shores made guests of the fugitive and the downtrodden. I thought, wow, if that's a church, you know, if that was my church at the end of the day, yes, we make guests of the fugitive and the downtrodden. You know, they're flocking to us because Roger Williams says, I, I've made a state that, that will accept you because God does, and I'm here to love you. And I'm not here to continue in your war, in your famine, in your sickness, in your illness, that we're here to heal that and to give you so much more. I just, oh, at the end of that, I was just like, well, if all of our churches just focused on being that little state, um, what a witness we would be to the world. And, and I think God was able to use 
those, those founders to create um, elements in our nation that have blessed people oh, undoubtedly. In, in a beautiful way. And Roger Williams suffered much in order to found that little island of intellectual liberty. Praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing that. Let's look at Tuesday's lesson briefly. We've got about 10 minutes left here, a little bit less than that. Um, when we look at Jeremiah chapter 11, the scripture at the top says, yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in his own imagination of their own evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Um, I've got highlighted that second sentence. I'll read the first with it. It says, look at the above text. The Lord says that he will bring upon them all the words of this covenant. Yet, he's talking about something bad. But we tend to think of the covenant as offering us only something good. Now, when we start thinking about these elements, I think what we have to realize is that something that's not very heretofore in our culture today is the concept of God's love, which actually wounds at times. The Bible says the wounds of a friend can be trusted. When we think about God's dealing with Israel, he's the ultimate parent, and he brings these things upon them to awaken them from their spiritual stupor. But it appears that we're more worried about how people look at us or feel about us. Sometimes that love is not well received by the ones who are receiving it. And if you've had two children that have a little different disposition or temperament, you understand what we're talking about. And for me, who raised three sons and uh, a daughter, they all have a little different approach. I'm learning. This is where the metaphor doesn't work very good because God's not learning anything on the way. But I'm learning as a parent while they're learning as children. And that cycle is growing. God is going to be the ultimate parent. And he's not going to give away what's already been paid for to the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's intervening to make sure they don't lose it in their ignorance or indifference. David. One thing I think is vital is as society becomes darker and dar darker morally is that as a remnant, we continue to reflect the love and character of Christ in our everyday lives. Because if we don't do that, there's no place that, that people in the world can turn who are desperately looking for hope. And um, I think one of the big mistakes, we, we talk a lot, Pastor Kelly, about how, why so many youth leave the Adventist church. And I have always said, I, it, I don't think it has anything to do with us not being enough like the world, I think it has us, um, it has more to do with us not being more like the Bible and reflecting the love of Christ and the character of Christ in our everyday lives. And the bottom of this lesson is talking about those relational components. So the covenant relationship is a commitment, it says, just a sentence up from the bottom paragraph. It's a commitment, one as serious and sacred as marriage, which is why the Lord uses that imagery. And then the last paragraph says, the point is that Israel's apostasy did not have its root in disobedience, but in a broken personal relationship with the Lord, a break that resulted in disobedience that finally brought punishment upon them. All right, let's go to Wednesday's lesson. The remnant. So how do you become the remnant? Well, God chooses you. The fact of the matter is, some people don't want to be chosen. They don't want the responsibilities, and they certainly don't see the privileges. All right, let's look a few of those texts up. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 3, uh, David, and then uh, Micah 4, 6, and 7, Pastor Page, and Zephaniah 3, 12 to 13. Uh, maybe, Pastor Bob, you could look that one up. So the first paragraph says, although God's plan for ancient Israel was spoiled by disobedience, it was never completely frustrated. And we should all say, praise the Lord. Among the weeds, a few flowers still grew. And many of the Old Testament prophets speak of this faithful remnant whom God would gather into himself as a lovely bouquet. I like that writing. All right, who has Isaiah 4.3? Is that you, Pastor David? Okay. And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, everyone who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. Okay, so God's going to spare some people. Praise the Lord. Okay, Pastor Page, what do you have there? It says, In that day, saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that has, that has been afflicted, and I will make her that halteth a remnant, and her that was cast out, of a strong nation, 
that was cast out a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. Okay, not quite the glorious diadem of a people that clearly are blessed, but kind of a ragtag group that's left around and halting, but God's still going to do something with them. Pastor Bob, do you have uh, Zephaniah there by chance? I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Okay, so listen, when we look at the Old Testament, it might do something for us as we look at some modern churches. That's kind of what the bottom pink paragraph is asking. You know, this woman that left the church and said, none of those people are Christian. Uh, the fact of the matter is that some of these relationships go through bad times. God doesn't give up on you. He doesn't give up on me. He doesn't give up on us. That doesn't excuse the fact that our, our poor relationship may have ill effects on other people. But isn't it a wonderful thing that God is patient? When we read 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, the first descriptor is love is patient. And there's a reason that's there. When God, when God calls us, He prom gives us the promised blessings, but He doesn't necessarily give the curse Himself, but He allows Satan to bring to us the results of our doing so that we learn. And so, in God's great mercy, He allows us to get ourselves into trouble so that we will realize that His way is the best. Well, fortunately, there is a potential to reap most bad decisions in their final form before life ends. And uh, the natural result of sin leads us to that place. Let's end talking about spiritual Israel, all right? What is our element of faithfulness to Christ? What is his element of faithfulness to us? Let's look at Galatians 3, 26 to 29 real quickly as we come down to the last few minutes of our lesson today. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. So Paul is going to make sure that everybody knows that they do belong, that there is a place for them. Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Carletta, do you have that there? So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male than female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Hmm. All right, so that makes all of us sitting in this auditorium today inheritors of the promise. Now, this is pretty good news. If we choose to see it so in the full spectrum of what it means to be royal, what it means to be priestly, if it means you're priestly, it means that everybody listening today is a pastor and you've got a flock. It means that there's spiritual privileges and obligations for all of us in our sphere of relationships. You may be that last little preservative agent in your circle of social networking. Who are you? Do you understand in God you're an heir of the king? Yeah, that's what stands out here, that our identity is in Christ. It doesn't matter uh, our upbringing, our culture, our education, none of that matters is what Christ is saying here. Is if we're in him, if we put on Christ, then our identity is in him, and therefore we are then Abraham's seed, children of the promise. What a beautiful privilege to be sons and daughters of God. Amen. So I, I'm, I've got a couple quick comments here, and then I'm going to tie it off with the last paragraph from the lesson. We'll go Bob and then Carletta. If we really are, have put on Christ, then we will be praying and mediating for those who are not mediating for themselves. Well, this is probably the one great sin of the remnant at all times and all ages, that the blessings are weaponized as curses. We fall in love with the blessings, and they're not seen as stewards. We're not seen as stewards of the blessings for those that have not yet know they're part of an, an everlasting inheritance. You just inspired me with your comment about each of us having a flock and made me immediately start thinking, who are my flock? They're my, my family, of course. They're my siblings. We have a, a texting group and we text together every Sabbath and be, you know, we have a chance to influence them. They're my neighbors. 
they're my friends here in church. They're the people I encounter when I go about my business and how I treat them. And if I think of each one of them as somebody that I can influence and help them draw closer to God, it changes how I think about them. Amen. Absolutely. Now listen, friends, we're ending on this note. You are to inherit the earth, made new, perfect, the Garden of Eden, a kingly place in a kingly palace. The question is, will we receive the awesome privilege of the representation, whether it brings us fame or misfortune, on the way? The one promise we have is that he said he would never leave us or forsake us. And it says in the Psalms that God rebuked kings for Abraham's sake because he was his friend. I don't know when we'll be called to suffer, when we'll be called to take risk like the saving of Lot and his family. I don't know when we'll be afraid and think that we might die, like when he made two sojourns down to Egypt. But I do know this, God is faithful. And sometimes through the journey of sacrifice, he opens up amazing understandings, like when he laid Isaac on an altar. Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. The whole spectrum of the plan of salvation, at least up to the providing of the promised seed, Abraham saw it on Moriah. There's all kinds of things he wants to show you. Don't miss the opportunity of reminding yourself every day, I'm a child of the king. All right, let's uh, have a closing prayer here. Brother David, if you'd have that for us. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege of being the remnant. And we thank you for that, that we might be a light to the world around us. I pray, Father, that all of the churches within our country and throughout the world would be sanctuaries yes. of righteousness and sanctuaries of light and love, but not just for us, but for those in the world who want to find your love. I pray that you would help us to continue to be that light, to continue to draw nearer to you until we reflect your love so perfectly that we are ready for your second coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. So nice to have you here for the Sabbath School lesson. Uh, for those that are lingering for the second service, you want to move into a pew that has no blue tape on it. For those that are not lingering, because you've already been here for Sabbath School and, and uh, the first service, if you'll slip outside, enjoy your fellowship out in the fresh air, this will make us good stewards of our public health and well-being. God bless you, and church will start in about six minutes. Thank you.